Hi, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second of our, our two virtual open days. My name is Andre Palmer, uh, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, I was just giving other attendees uh, a little bit of time to join us, but I think we could get started. We have 45 minutes for this session today. So in the interest of time, we'll, we'll get started. This session will be recorded and, and will be made available for those who uh, wish to see a recording afterwards. Great, there we go. Of course, there's always going to be technical glitches, right? Uh, let's, before we get into it, let's just talk real quickly about what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at a recap of the first virtual session. So we'll, we'll talk quickly about the rights of the data subjects. We will also talk about the responsibilities of data controllers. And we will look at the fact that data protection is really everybody's responsibility. We will also be talking about the role of the data protection officer as well. And we'll be looking at a case example just to look at the characteristics of an effective compliance program and what that could look like for your organization. We're going to also be talking uh, briefly about a data privacy and protection career, the training and development path uh, that one could take. And then we'll be doing a quick demo of the Jamaica Data Protection Act platform. With me today is David Wright. He is the manager uh, in the Cyber and Information um, Security Unit. He is also a lead consultant in the Data Privacy and Protection Implementation team. Uh, and my name is Andre Palmer. As I said before, I am the Director of Strategic Client Engagement. So, David, let's get straight into it. There's a little bit about SimTag Consulting for, for those who've never um, really come across us before. But in the interest of time, I'll skip over that and we'll just get straight into the um, the recap. Perhaps we can start, David, by you telling us a little bit about um, the rights of data subject. Well, before we actually even get into that, quickly, just uh, maybe a couple of lines about the Jamaica Data Protection Act. Okay, thank you, Andre. All right, so the Jamaica Data Protection Act uh, was originally passed in uh, 2020 and uh, it comes into force on December 1st of 2023. And it outlines a number of things regarding the handling of personal data. First of all, the rights of data subjects, and we'll talk a little about who data subjects are, but also the requirements for data controllers. And we'll also define data controllers in our discussion, as well as the standards for processing personal data. Uh, data protection is not new. Uh, but it would be new to Jamaica in that uh, many of us would be familiar with the GDPR, which came to prominence in about 2018 when that was passed. But that would not have been the first uh, privacy law or privacy regulation, as uh, privacy is a concept that is has been around for a while. Uh, privacy deals with the right to be left alone. And most of all, we have been concerned with our physical space. We don't want people coming into our physical space, but now it extends to even our digital space, which sometimes uh, intermingles with our physical space in that, you know, once our information gets out, it allows uh, greater accessibility to us as well as harm that could actually be done. So as a result, the, the law came into force and it is here to protect all of us. Great. And I, I'm glad that you kind of touched on the fact that it is here to protect the rights of, of individuals. So, so let's segue uh, a little bit then into what we talked about uh, with Daniel in the last session, Daniel Monroe, which was uh, a fundamental aspect of the Jamaica Data Protection Act, which is the rights of data subjects. Uh, perhaps you could just do a quick recap for us. All right, thanks, Andre. So there are six rights of data subjects. And the, the first right is that of the right to access personal data. And what this speaks about is that data subjects, which is really all of us, uh, who the data controller, the entities who we do business with or who employ us, uh, they are the holders of the data, but we are the owners of the data. And we have a right to request in writing uh, what data the entity has on us, as well as uh, if we so desire to request a copy of the data that they, they have on us. Uh, the, the next right is that of consent to processing in that 
once this entity has collected our data and provided us with appropriate notice, we have a right to uh, provide our consent before they can go ahead and process our data. But there is a further right, which is the consent that is required for direct marketing. So while I might want to do business with an entity, um, I may not necessarily want them to, uh, uh, per or I should say, market to me after. I might just want to do a transaction to purchase a product. And yes, they would have captured my data, but I would need to provide additional explicit consent. So those are the first three rights. Uh, the, the fourth right is the right to prevent processing. And the data subject has a right to um, instruct the data controller to not process their data if for argument's sake, the data is incomplete or inaccurate. And there are a number of other stipulations, such as depending on the source of the data, if it may have been collected without the knowledge or the consent of the data subject. Uh, the fifth right is that of uh, related to automated decision taking. And of course, nowadays, you know, AI is so popular and we have uh, automated decisions being made about data subjects. And the data subject has a right to, if a decision is made based on an automated means, to request details as to the logic that was used to make that decision. And if they are unsatisfied with the decision, they have a right to object and to request that a uh, different decision or another decision be made um, with human intervention. The final right is that of the rectification of inaccuracy, somewhat connected to a couple of the other rights I mentioned earlier, the right to access. So once you're aware of the data that the data controller has on you, the data subject has a right to request that any inaccuracies be corrected, whether it be to uh, erase a piece of the data or to correct it or otherwise. Great. So, so David, what are the things that you know you 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 said? I was trying to count in my head. There are a number of times you said data subjects, right? And, and I lost count. Yes. And there are a lot of these um these terms and definitions in the Jamaica Data Protection Act. Um, but obviously the fundamental one is data subjects. Who is a data subject? Right. So the data subject, as I mentioned earlier, is the person who the data is about. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is that. You know, a lot of persons may be thinking that, okay, well, the data subject is just the customer of an entity. Uh, and that is correct. So, you know, I'm doing a number of trainings with a number, a number of companies. And, you know, as the staff is being dragged to this training, they're like, this is one more training I need to do, uh, you know, about what I'm supposed to do on my job. Uh, but I want you to, and I, and I ask persons to look at this from two lenses. The first of which is try to have an appreciation for the law, uh, for the fact that we are data subjects being employees of the entities that we work for. So the company collects data on us. So we are the data subject in that instance. Uh, the second is that we are also uh, data subjects of the entities that we do business with because they are collecting and handling uh, and processing data on us as well. So the data subject is the person who the data is about. Uh, and by extension, the data controller holds the data and they make decisions about what data to collect, the reason they are collecting it, and how it is to be processed. That's great, because a part of, of in as much as me trying to understand the Jamaica Data Protection Act so that I can enable my company to be compliant, it's also important for me to understand it from a personal perspective. So when I go to my financial institution, for example, or when I go to a supermarket and they're asking me to fill out a loyalty form, or when I uh, interact with a call center and they're asking me to verify bits of information, it's important that I also know what my rights are under the Jamaica Data Protection Act. Um, so it, it, it is very personal as much as it is obviously, you know, corporate responsibility as well. And these are some of the things the Jamaica Data Protection Act actually touches on. So it will touch on the definition of a data subject. It will touch on the definition of a data controller, the entity that is collecting the information and deciding how that information is being used. It will also uh, touch on the data processor, the entity that may be processing the data on behalf of a data controller, for example, and some of the, the other nuances that are contained within the Jamaica Data Protection Act. So I know I just mentioned data controller, uh, perhaps, David, you could talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the responsibilities of the data control as we talked about the last time. All right, Andre. So the, the data controller has a, a number of responsibilities, the first of which is uh, 
as at December 1st or by December 1st, they should register with the Office of the Information Commissioner. A data controller that has not registered with the Office of the Information Controller by the deadline would be considered in breach of the Jamaica Data Protection Act. Uh, and of course, there are some fines as well as jail time that are associated with uh, those breaches. I won't go into the details of those, uh, but essentially no data controller should process personal data unless they have registered. Uh, the, another responsibility or requirement of the data controller is that uh, depending on the nature of the organization, they should appoint a data protection officer, uh, sometimes referred to as a DPO. The DPO is that point person who oversees the privacy program within the organization. Uh, they are somewhat of a liaison with the Office of the Information uh, Commissioner, as well as the person who the data subjects contact in order to exercise their rights, whether it be the rights that, uh, of accessing their data and the others that I would have mentioned earlier. Um, another uh, requirement is that of, and, it, and it's not necessarily spoken of in the requirement section of the Data Protection Act, uh, but the, the, the data controller should do what is referred to as a data protection impact assessment, sometimes also referred to as a DPIA. And essentially what that is, is an assessment of the risks of privacy harm that can come about based on the type of processing of data and also put forward the mitigation or the measures that can be used to reduce the likelihood or the effect or the impact of some of those risks if they were to be realized. So those are essentially the primary requirements of the data controller. Awesome. Uh, and whose responsibility is data protection and privacy within the organization? A lot of people think it is, this is something that legal and compliance ought to do. Some say, well, it's IT's responsibility. Other says, well, it's really marketing. Other says it's the office of the executive. But 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 who who is responsible for protecting the rights of data subjects within the organization? All right, so Andre, I'll, I'll actually answer this way. The first of which is, as you mentioned, there are a number of definitions in the Data Protection Act. Uh, one of which I'll highlight now, which is that of processing. And uh, Spirio, reading it, but essentially when you look at the definition there, it is so wide and um, all encompassing in that once you handle the data in any way, shape or form, and I want to highlight the fact that it's not just digital data, it's any data. So if, even, even if it's stored in, in paper form. So what that means is that, as I said, once you are using the data or coming into contact with the data, and I'll use an extreme example, uh, if you have someone who is transporting uh, files that are supposed to go to the offsite location for arch archival purposes. The person who is doing that transporting is handling that personal data. Because of course, there are risks that can come about during transportation. The person who at the end of the archival period for the data, who is shredding those documents or destroying the hard drives or the tapes, they are also handling personal data. So I want to highlight the fact that once you come into contact with the data, you are uh, processing data, and as a result, you must abide by the standards. So what that means then is that everybody in the organization, once you come into contact with uh, personal data, you're handling data, and as a result, it is everybody's business. And I think that the mistake that a lot of people make is that this is all about IT, and you mentioned it, you know, this is an IT matter. But as I pointed out, even if you don't use electronic storage, once you have personal data in any shape or form, uh, the, the law applies. So, 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 and, and I'm glad that you, you actually um, mentioned that, you know, it, it's everybody's responsibility. So how does the Jamaica Data Protection Act short course that is offered by CIPTA Consulting help to prepare individuals within organizations to become part of the data protection ecosystem? Okay, so, so Andre, I would have had the benefit of going through the course when you know we had it in beta form. And for me, it, it was useful given that the Jamaica Data Protection Act is 123 pages. It is divided into seven parts and it's written in legalese. And I probably only got through the first parts um, and the other parts, you know, just snippets of it. But I think what it does is that it gives a good introduction to the, to the act. Um, and, and it informs us of our rights and, and the requirements. 
And the analogy that I'll use is that, I mean, many of us are drivers and I'm sure none of us have read the Road Traffic Act. However, we may have read this red book that would have taught us how to drive or, you know, we may have got instructions otherwise. So what the Jamaica Data Protection Act short course does is saves us from having to read the legalese and the, the long uh, act itself, but it just gives us all the main points that we really need to pay attention to if we are to one, comply, as well as be informed of our rights. I, I love that. I love that. You know, so 123 pages um, are condensed into this almost two hour short course that, that you could do literally in one day. And we've actually done the hard work of distilling the most important pieces of the act and translate that in a way that can be consumed and understood by, by the lay person in a nutshell is, is, is what you're saying. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, David. So I, I kind of want to segue the conversation a little bit to talk about the role of the data protection officer, DPO, because that is one of the things that is featured quite heavily in the act. And as you said in the beginning, will be one of the responsibilities of organizations to appoint a suitably qualified data protection officer. So first let's talk about the role of the data protection officer, and then we'll talk about what suitably qualified means. Okay, so, so the role of the data uh, protection officer, the DPO, uh, as I said, this person would be responsible for oversight of the of the data protection program. So what that would look like is uh, providing guidance to the organization at all levels in terms of what is required. Uh, it would include monitoring the operations to ensure that there is compliance. It would require regular auditing, uh, updating of processes. Uh, I would also say, you know, ensuring that persons are trained and not just trained, but ensuring that the adequate awareness and reinforcement is there. Uh, you know, just recently we concluded some training uh, for an entity and shortly after the training, there was a violation in that personal data was left lying around in the office. And, you know, it, it just means that this person has to be on top of things. Uh, but I'll also add that one of the things that the data protection officer is responsible uh, for is Yes, lies in with the Office of the Information Commissioner, but this person is actually a watchdog and a whistleblower for any violations of the Jamaica Data Protection Act within the organization. If they observe any infractions of the, the law, they are required to bring it to the attention of the data controller. So this person is and has to be independent. And if they are not satisfied with how the uh, notice of the infraction is handled, they have the right to actually uh, go to the Office of the Information Commissioner and report the data controller. And in doing their job, uh, they are protected by the law in that they should not be fired or come under any other repercussion from the organization because they have uh, brought to the attention the, of the, the infraction to the Office of the Information Commissioner. So at a bare minimum, then, it sounds to me that the data protection officer needs to have a really good understanding of what the Jamaica Data Protection Act requires of them. And I suspect that is why the act says this person or entity should be suitably qualified. So perhaps talk to us a little bit about how the Jamaica Data Protection Act short course helps to bridge that knowledge gap for someone like a data protection officer, for example. Well, I would I would start by saying it's, a, it's an introduction for someone who is a data protection officer. Um, and I would recommend that someone with a data protection officer go on to actually read the relevant uh, sections of, of the act. But where I think would be really helpful for them is uh, for the wider education of the staff to ensure that persons are aware of what they ought to do. Um, it would be very difficult, as I said, you know, to ensure that everybody knows unless they go through the appropriate training, uh, because nobody's going to take up the act and read it. But it is definitely a very good introduction for a data protection officer. But I would recommend that they go on to read the act. And there are some other courses that Simtai offers, which I suspect we may talk about later, which would also reinforce as well as add to what they would have covered in the act. I want to say this about the act, which is that it is prescriptive, but not descriptive, in that it tells us what we're supposed to do, but it doesn't go into the detail as to how we're to execute, execute some of those activities. 
uh, the regulations are expected and some have been in draft form and we expect them to come out. Uh, but you know, the, the guidance that we need beyond our act is actually examples from the GDPR as an example. And as I said, I, I know you'll probably touch on that a little later in, 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 in our conversation. Yes, certainly, certainly. Uh, David, as an organization, we've been working with with entities uh, from as far back as 2018 to help them to understand what various data privacy and protection legislations require of them. Right. And then on the other side, to help them to become compliant since the passage of the general data protection regulation. And one of the things that I have heard from clients consistently is that this is a huge compliance hurdle, which almost feels impossible. They're like, you know what? The data protection legislations require a lot of us. And in some cases, it's it's hard or it seems impossible to, impossible to become compliant. So as a consultant working with organizations, I'd love for you to talk to us a little bit about um, what good looks like. What are the components of a data privacy practice or data privacy program that organizations ought to consider to make it uh, uh, worthwhile for, for them? All right, that, that's a good question. And I, I'll start this way though, that the good news is that while it may seem like a mammoth task to become compliant, a lot of organizations are already on the way. You know, they're, they're already practicing some things that can be applied and built upon uh, to have a, a, a robust data privacy program. Uh, the first of which is ensuring that they have a governance framework in place um, and, and a number of other frameworks. But from a governance standpoint, uh, ensuring that they have the appropriate policies and procedures and standards and guidelines. And of course, not only making sure that they have them, but that they are abided by and they are enforced and they are updated regularly. And the staff is made aware of them and, and the practice uh, what's, what they stipulate. I'll also add uh, an information technology and security framework as well in that you know the privacy requires for the for the electronic data of course uh, the appropriate technical measures right so organizations that already have an information technology and an information security framework in place are already well on their way and i'll also add risk management in terms of continuously identifying and analyzing assessing the various risks uh, privacy risks are now being introduced. As a result, if they already have these frameworks for governance, uh, information technology, and information security, risk management, building on top of that strong foundation is, is a good start. Um, so essentially, you know, some of the, the work that we are encouraging them to do has already been done. So what we're doing is layering privacy practices on top of the already good practices. One of the things, thank you, David. One of the things I should have said at the beginning is to to our attendees is um, feel free to drop your questions in the Q and A um, feature uh, within the platform or in, in the chat feature. If you do have questions or or comments, uh, we do have some time towards the end of this conversation to respond to as many questions as we are able to. Um, if we are not able to respond to your questions during this session. Uh, we will get a written response um, back to you, but do feel free to drop your questions in. Um, David, to come back to, to, to the point you're making around what good looks like. Right. One of the things, uh, so you talked about the governance, you talked about the security framework, you talked about the monitoring and evaluating other program. Um, but, but the success or failure, as we have seen when we go into some of these organizations, the success or failure of, a, a, a data privacy program hinges a lot on on the human element, the extent to which the staff members adopt and embrace and practice some of these data privacy principles. Again, just talk to us about you know the the um, aspect of training uh, and continuous awareness as part of an effective data privacy program. Okay, all right. So so I'll talk a little about the training, but I also talk about. Uh, you know, change management. And one of the things that um, I've observed is that, you know, different entities handle things uh, different, way of different ways, of course. Um, but what we have found is that early sensitization and early training uh, tends to get the buy-in 
to ensure that there's success because it's still early days. And in order to have the, the work move smoothly in terms of implementing the necessary measures and practices, you have to get the buy-in buy -in from right across the organization. Uh, so early training, early sensitization, as well as I would say continuous training, still early days, but continuous training is also required. Because once people know what is required, it's easier for them to, to apply it to what they need to do for their day-to-day -day jobs. Um, so as I said, early training, early sensitization, and buying. Um, and, and the buying comes about also by getting people involved. Uh, once they have now learned as to you know, what are the requirements and uh, what are the rights, they can now get involved in some of the work that needs to be done to get the organization ready for December 1st and going forward. Excellent. Great. And that is, again, how the Jamaica Data Protection Act short course helps organizations um, with that broad sensitization that you've spoken about. Um, and when you do register for the uh, for the course, you have 30 days to complete the content and you can go in and do it as many times as you want. There is also a very short quiz at the end. Uh, and once you successfully complete that, there is a certification uh, that says to the organization and to other people in, in the market that you have at least at a very minimum taken some fundamentals or the fundamentals in understanding the uh, certain aspect of the Jamaica Data Protection Act. I want to go back to a conversation we started about the um, this statement in the act that says that the EPO should be suitably qualified. And Ryan Campbell, I saw a question you know, coming in from Ryan. He's asking, what would suit, what would be suitable qualifications for a DPO? Um, before you respond, David, one of the things I will say is that the guidelines and the regulations that will accompany the act have not yet been published. Um, but once they've been or, or ratified rather, but once ratified, they will give some guidance around what suitably qualified uh, really ought to mean. But David, perhaps you can give a more fulsome response in terms of what a suitable qualification path could look like for a data protection officer or anyone actually who is interested in pursuing a career in data privacy and protection. So, so Andre, the first of which is having an understanding and appreciation of the law itself. So the Jamaica Data Protection Act short course, the JDPA short course, as I mentioned earlier, is definitely a good introduction. Uh, as well as reading the act itself. But I would also add that in the absence of some of the regulations to bring about the clarity, because there's a lot of questions being asked about what is required. Uh, I think that good guidance from the GDPR is also helpful. And I find that the CIPP e-course, uh, I must say I've, I've been going through some of the material recently, and I've noticed that it, it gives a layman's view of the GDPR and some of its requirements. The JDPA is very similar to the GDPR in a lot of the, the rights and the requirements and the standards. In fact, uh, it is believed that it was modeled off of either the GDPR or some of what the GDPR itself was modeled off of. So I believe that the CIPP course is a, is a good introduction as well to some of how to operate uh, for, the, for, for when the app comes into to force. I'd also add that the CIPM, that is the Certified Information Privacy Manager, uh, provides a good end-to-end -end view of what the assessments of your privacy program, as well as what are the things that need to be implemented in terms of, in terms of the policy, poli policies, uh, the protection mechanisms, as well as how to monitor the program in terms of how to respond to data subject requests, as well as uh, the hopefully uh, not but the very likely instance that there are breaches. How do you respond to the data subject as well as to the uh, information commissioner? So those two courses, the Certified Information Privacy Manager and the Certified Information Privacy Professional uh, courses, I believe, provide a good foundation for uh, guidance for data protection acts. Excellent. So just to recap what you're saying, David, the Jamaica Data Protection Act certainly is a good starting point in terms of understanding the local legislation and the local context um, supplemented by what the International Association of Privacy Professionals recommends, which is the CIPPE, which is Certified Information Privacy Professional, modeled on the GDPR, as well as the CIPM, which is the Certified Information Privacy Manager 
course, um, all of which Simtai offers as well. In fact, Simtai is the only accredited training provider within the Caribbean um, by the International Association for Privacy Professionals offering CIPM, CIPPE, and CIPT training courses. Um, what I want to do real quickly before we kind of jump into some of the, qu the questions that have been coming into the, some of the other questions that have been coming into the Q&A function is just a quick um, look at the, uh, the Jamaica Data Protection Act short course. Um, there are a number of, of, of modules. It, it certainly is a, it's an easy course to kind of walk through. There is a voiceover. I mean, you're hearing my voice now, but there is an actual uh, professional voiceover that's done um, to guide you through the content, uh, as well as for people who may have um, challenges, uh, this, this certain types of accessibility challenges um, as well. So that we find to be really helpful. In terms of what the content looks like, the um, there is at the beginning uh, an introduction to the Jamaica Data Protection Act. Well, before that, it starts with looking at why data privacy and protection is a necessary area for organizations to function on. It looks at what's happening globally. It looks at some of the developments in North America, in Europe, in parts of Asia, and obviously, you know, the 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 the, the need for Jamaica to follow suit. Then it kind of moves into the uh, definition, some of the definitions. Um, we hear a lot about personal data, personally identifiable data, personally sensitive data. So it goes into some of the definitions, uh, you know, uh, data controller, data processor, um, and some of those other things that you've, you've heard us talk about as well. It then moves to talk a little bit about the rights of data subjects. And as David talked at the beginning, of this conversation, there are six fundamental rights, and it goes into quite a bit of detail about each of those, um, as well as it talks about the responsibilities of data controllers as well. The short course goes into processing standards, which is a fundamental area of, of the act, uh, because this really speaks to the conditions under which an organization can process or should process the personal information or personal data that they collect um, and quite a bit of, of, of information around that. And then it also looks at some of the ramifications of non-compliance, some of the you know, offenses um, and the fines that are, that are attached. At the end of the course, there is a, a, a quiz. Well, there's a short quiz at the end of each module, but at the end of the actual course, there is a short uh, quiz and you are required to get 80% in order to, to pass. If you don't get 80%, that's fine. You can always go back and uh, and redo the course. Um, and once you successfully complete, then a certificate is issued uh, to demonstrate that you have in fact completed the course. So in a nutshell, that is the Jamaica Data Protection Act short course. And I'm glad I kind of got through that because I wanted for us to spend some time just responding to as many of the questions that actually came into the chat. Um, this, this is an interesting one from Karen Chambers uh, Cox, David. The, the question is, is it required that all organizations need to register with the Office of the, Inf of the Information Commission? Commissioner, uh, yeah, she said data commissioner, but it is the OIC Office of the Information Commissioner. Yeah, so the, the short answer is that uh, there are some exceptions and the, the act speaks to the exceptions, but essentially the, the organizations that are definitely required to are those that will be processing sensitive personal data. Uh, those that are processing data of uh, on a large scale and that is still yet to be defined. Uh, those that uh, are processing data for a particular class of data subject. And um, as I said, it's, it's actually easier to, to identify the, the exceptions. Um, but you know, one would have to go through the course or just read through that specific section in the act to see where the, the act would not apply. But for most organizations that are collecting and processing data, especially for commercial purpose, uh, are required to register. And the registration uh, deadline, just to remind you, is by December 1st of 2023. All right, so let's stay on registration because Rachel is asking a question, uh, Rachel Matthews. How does one register with the commission? 
All right, so at this point, the guidance for the registration would come out in the regulations, which are yet to be received. But at, based on what we're aware, um, there are two possible methods by which one can register. Uh, there may very likely be a website for the Office of Information Commissioner that one can um, upload the, inf the necessary information or the information can be provided um, in a PDF format as well. Thank you. Uh, so so here is a, a, an interesting one. So I'm going to just ask you to give the highlight for this one. Can you speak to how changes in the Act or the implementation of the Act, I imagine, will impact human resources practices such as recruiting, onboarding, and offboarding of staff? For example, HR might not be able to ask for information such as medical history or criminal records. Uh, that's, that's, that's a question. Right. So... A couple of responses I want to give to that. First of all, let me speak with the last part, which is about the medical history or criminal records. That is constituted as what is referred to as sensitive personal data. And the Act speaks to the fact that sensitive personal data should not be processed unless a uh, separate, um, I would say, um, approval is, is granted for that. There must be an appropriate lawful basis for the reason of collecting the, the data. And there are seven lawful bases they include vital interest, which is one uh, lawful base that could apply for the reason uh, to collect medical history. And essentially what vital uh, interest is, is that this may be required to save the person's life. Uh, there are other uh, lawful bases, I won't go through all of them, but once the lawful basis applies, you can collect that data. But the one thing I want to point out about HR and the onboarding process is that sometimes HR departments collect information about persons upfront by their resume, as well as sometimes some application forms that may be filled out at the point that they are coming from an interview. If the candidate is not selected and the purpose of collecting that information no longer applies, that information should be discarded of in an appropriate manner. Excellent. Thank you. Um, another one, does the size of the organization matter, especially where the only personal data that is being collected is that of the employees? Um, a, a little bit of a tricky one. Um, it, it depends on, sorry, it depends on the, the size of the company in terms of the number of employees. Um, I must say there, I, I can't recall a specific stipulation in the, in the act. Um, in terms of the number of employees at this moment. I must confess I can't admit that um, answer to that one right away. But I would recommend that, you know, the specific uh, section of the act be referred to as relates to the number of employees and the, the number of customers as well. But I mentioned earlier that in terms of the number of customers, the regulation will speak to what is referred to as um, on a large scale. Uh, yeah, so so just to kind of extend um, the answer to, to, to that question, David. So while not, not all aspects of the Jamaica Data Protection Act will apply to every single entity in the same way, all organizations need to comply uh, with the protection of personal data component. So whether you are a small organization that, uh, you know, is only collecting um, personal data for your employees or you're a large multinational, you still are required to ensure that you are protecting the personal information that you are collecting. So while you may not be required to register with the Office of the Information Commissioner, uh, for example, or to appoint a data protection officer, uh, you still do have a responsibility under the law to ensure that you are implementing measures to protect the, uh, the rights of the, the data subjects, which in this case would be your employees. Um, another question, is there a certificate of compliance to show that an organization is compliant in relation to the act? If yes, how does one acquire the certificate? That's an interesting one, right? Uh, yeah, and, and the way I'd answer this one is actually that um, there is a stipulation in the act that a data subject can actually contact the Office of the Information Commissioner uh, to get the details of registration for the data controller. And they can actually request that in writing as well uh, for a fee. So essentially, that would somewhat be like a certificate of compliance of the organization. Great, thank you. Another one, for small companies, do we need to outsource uh, the DPO function? 
All right, so, so the first question which wasn't asked is, do we need to have a DPU? And again, the act actually speaks to uh, the stipulations for which you require a DPO. If hiring a DPO, a full-time DPO is um, not necessary or not, um, you know, it's not affordable, it, yes, one can outsource the DPO service. And Simtai does offer the DPO as a service um, as one of our offerings as well. Excellent. Another one, what documents are required to register with the Office of the Information Commissioner? In terms of documentation, we're taking guidance from what would have been done uh, for GDPR. They refer to it as the record of processing activities. The act actually speaks to the contents of it, but not the name. And essentially, what that is, is a description of the uh, classes of data subjects, the types of data that is collected on them, um, and any entity who data may be transferred to, especially if it is a third country, um, other than Jamaica, of course, uh, as well as what are the measures that are put in place to protect that data. So essentially, those are some of the items that are required when uh, registering with the Office of the Information Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, another one, what is the cost of the course? So the cost of the Jamaica Data Protection Act short course is $50, 50 US um, for individuals. For group registrations, there are uh, group, book group rates available. So do reach out to us either at academy at simtai.com, training at simtai.com, or directly to me, Andre underscore Palmer at simtai.com um, for more details if you're looking to register on behalf of your organization or a, a group of individuals. Um, there's a question to around how can we contact your organization for a consultation? The contact details are up on the screen. I've just put those up. Um, the website is www simtai.com um, or you can reach out to us at academy uh, at simtai.com or info at simtai.com you can also connect with us on all of our social media platforms as well person is, is being asked if, of whether we operate in trinidad we do have clients in trinidad we do not have an office in trinidad but we do have a client we had a, we actually had an office in trinidad uh, for a number of years and we still have quite a number of clients um, in Trinidad. Currently, we operate or we have clients in about 25 countries. Um, so we, we do operate across a number of different jurisdictions. Uh, question for you, David. Does the Data Protection Act include ret a retention period for personal data or other data? All right. So the, the short answer is no. And uh, what the guidance would be other laws that apply. Uh, just to point out that the Jamaica Data Protection Act does not override any other law that exists. So if the statute of limitation speaks to seven years or if some other um, industry-based act or law speaks to a particular period for different types of data, that is what would apply. Great, thank you. How will this be policed, though, the Data Protection Act? Um, companies' annual returns? Uh, you know, I guess that, that's the question. How will it be policed? All right, the, the policing, uh, the first of which is, and if I'm to interpret it correctly, the first of which is the Office of the Information Commissioner will police to ensure that uh, registration does take place. That's the first of which is. Uh, the other aspect of it is with regard to ensuring that there is compliance. Again, that would be with the Office of the Information Commissioner. I'll also add that as it relates to any breaches that would take place. So we see a number of high profile breaches in the news lately. Uh, those should also be reported to the Office of the Information Commissioner. I think what was being implied there is in terms of the, the fines. I know that some of the fines are stipulated in the Act, but there is also reference to the 4% the of your annual gross returns, depending on the nature of the infraction. So, of course, that would be dependent on, yes, your company's returns for the previous year would be an input factor to, to determine the fines if you were to have a breach in the subsequent year. Great, thank you. Uh, and time maybe just to squeeze in one last question. This is from Peter Gay uh, Sanford. If an employee is no longer employed at an organization, are their records destroyed or returned to that employee? All right, so the, the guidance that we're given at this point is that only what is absolutely required after the employee leaves. For example, the information that would be needed to give a, a reference letter or a job letter to prove that the person had, had actually worked there. 
But other data, especially if it's sensitive data, the, the guidance is that it should be removed or archived and deleted at the appropriate time. Perfect, great, thank you so much. And again, the Jamaica Data Protection Act uh, touches on some of those, um, well, more in terms of the details around some of those questions. So things like um, purpose limitation, for example, limitation periods, um, lawful processing, all of that stuff. The Act is, the, the Jamaica Data Protection Act, you can visit our website uh, to register. There is also a QR code on the screen. Again, it's $50 per person. Uh, for groups, do contact us. There are group rates available. And we do have two trainings coming up. We, someone asked earlier about the qualification or certification path for either a data protection officer or individuals who are interested in pursuing a career in data privacy and protection. The Certified Information Privacy Manager CIPM course comes up uh, next week, actually November 23 and 24, that's in person. And in December, we will be hosting a Certified Information Privacy Professional training course, that's December 5 and 6, also in person. And the cost for each is $1,750 um, plus GCT. Again, feel free to connect with us on all of our platforms. The information is on the screen. Uh, thank you so much for attending. I do see some other questions coming in and I wish we had a little bit more time, but we will respond to these um, by, by email or post responses on our social media uh, platforms. Again, thank you so much for joining us for this Jamaica Data Protection Act virtual open day. And I do trust that you found the information interesting, useful, and informative. Thank you so much, David, for joining me for this conversation. As always, your knowledge about the Jamaica Data Protection Act and how you articulate um, just issues around data privacy is always um, so well received. Again, thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day.